Welcome back to Metropolitan Community College's 15th Annual Diversity Matters Book Series. It is also the beginning of the college's spring academic term. We wish a fresh and productive start to all faculty and students as they work toward academic goals. Your microphones and chat with other audience members are turned off. Send your messages or questions for our discussion leader through the chat function to moderator Barbara Velasquez. I will present your questions to our discussion leader. And also watch the chat for important messages. The online evaluation link will be presented. Also, there will be an opportunity to win a copy of today's book, The Sisters of Oswich. Scott Litke is the executive director of the Institute for Holocaust Education located in Omaha, Nebraska. He has been with the Institute for Holocaust Education, or IHE, since the summer of 2018 and is very proud of the work he and his staff are doing. IHE provides educational resources, workshops, survivor testimony, and integrated arts programming to students, educators, and the public. The Institute also provides support to Holocaust survivors in our community. IHE's goal is to ensure that the tragedy and history of the Holocaust are remembered, that appropriate fast-based instruction and materials are available to students, educators, and the public to enable them to learn the lessons of the Holocaust and that, as a result, we inspire our community to create a more just and equitable society. Scott holds a BA in history from Wayne State University and did his graduate work in education and Judaic studies. He served as a Jewish educator and education director for over 34 years in Detroit, Omaha, Ann Arbor, and Alexandria, Virginia. Scott is a trained Jad Vashem educator with a background in training educators and writing curriculum for Holocaust studies, mainly for use in supplementary schools. Scott and his wife, Alicia, have two grown children, Sarah, who made Aliyah at 19, served in the IDF and is currently living in Australia. Their son, Avi, is a graduate of Nebraska Wesleyan with a degree in theater directing and works in Washington, D.C. Finally, Scott's a devoted Detroit Tigers, Detroit Lions, and Washington Capitals fan. Please welcome Mr. Scott Litke. Thank you very much. It's an honor to be here. I have spent quite a bit of time thinking about what to talk about today, and um, we'll see how it goes. Uh, what I don't want to do is give the old-fashioned book report. And so I want to give you some background of that part of, uh, of the world and with the Holocaust. I also, as a teacher, uh, do enjoy questions at all and every time. So if you do have questions, please uh, put them into chat and Barbara will share them with me. Uh, I'm not sure right now if I'm coming across as the speaker on uh, when I put it on speaker view barbara it's still showing you and me up in the corner so i just want to make sure that you all are seeing if you have it on on uh speaker view that you're seeing my face and not just me up in the corner so if you would let barbara know and she can let our tech person know if there is a, a challenge there but i'll just keep talking so um the vision uh, just a little background with ihe that was that was given and basically it is um it, it thank you it it is um it's our goal to really to be very idealistic and to take the tragedies of the holocaust and use them to create a more equitable society through the idea of um teaching empathy understanding and to teach people to be upstanders and not bystanders when called upon and very much if you look at resistance during the Holocaust. It very much is that idea of being an upstander. And in a few minutes, I'll give you some other, some information just about the Netherlands in general. But I wanna just first start with that idea of resistance. 
because it's a very important topic to understand in Holocaust studies. And one is there, that it, it's not a simple answer. There aren't simple answers to the complexity of, of the Holocaust of this time period. But resistance came in all different forms, and if you want to say it in kind of in all different flavors. So not only is there resistance from uh, the non-Jewish community, there also are cases of very much different types of resistance, such as what we see in this book. And what is commonly a mis- understanding, I believe, and a lot of this is our, my belief, so I like to say I can always back this up with fact, is that Jews did not, were, were not willing participants in what happened to them. And that it, it's a, it is extremely complex, especially looking at Jewish history up till the 1930s, and, and that things that played into past experience that may have led to certain types of responses. But to think that Jews didn't have different types of resistance is absolutely not the truth. Now, when we think of resistance, typically we think of resistance in that that, that it being military, a military form of resistance. And as we know from, from what happens with within this the story of, of underground hiding what the things the different examples expressed in this book um it's it, not only is it complex but there's different ideas for that so and there's even you know there's even i've taught classes on actually even on spiritual resistance the those who use judaism religiously especially in the ghettos as a form of resistance but I want to raise for a first the first thing here before we get into some of it, because it really is a major part of this, is that resistance in general during this time period, and if and it's something that that we struggle with as Holocaust educators and something that we work on in taking in the subject matter here, is that there are only 25,000 people, non-Jewish people who have been recognized by Yad Vashem through the Holocaust facility and education um, school in Jerusalem as what we call righteous among the nations or righteous Gentiles. Those non-Jewish people who risked their lives to save at a minimum one Jewish person, and they couldn't have done this for any monetary reason, that they did it for doing, if we want to say, doing the right thing. When you think about the number of people who could have been righteous among the nations, meaning who could have, should have spoken up, done something, it's staggering when you think there's only 25,000. The other aspect of that is that when you have the opportunity and I've been very fortunate over my career to have been able to meet and speak with people who have been recognized as righteous among the nations. When you ask them why they did what they did, they don't know what you're talking about. They're wired that way. They were raised that way. The idea of that they don't, their idea was, well, why wouldn't we? Why shouldn't we? Why couldn't we have done more? And so that is one of our goals in, in what we do in modern Holocaust education is try to, to get people to think about those things and to, to think about what they would do if they were ever called upon and had the opportunity to assist, to stand up, to stand up to the wrongs in society. And so one thing that we do is we take the tragedies of the Holocaust and try to turn them into examples of how we can better this world. And so um, I like to tell students when I work with them, I am extremely idealistic. I believe in an old Talmudic uh, teaching that says the saving of one life is the saving of the world. And so I believe if I could change one person, then um, I've, I've done my job. So with that, um, I'd like to talk about the Netherlands. And what you need to understand in many ways, and again, a lot of these are, like I said, are my opinions, but I think I can prove these things. Every country 
or many of the countries invaded by Germany, by the Nazis, each had its own unique reaction, flavor, attitude, how they reacted to the Nazis, how they reacted to their Jewish population, how they reacted to the change, what was going on beforehand. And um, each one is very unique. And so there are people who are experts, obviously, then on, on individual areas. Holland, the Netherlands is not, um, is actually very much that, uh, that example. And also um, what needs to also be understood is that the death camps, when it came time for the, the when, when basically the, the moving of Jews from ghettos to death camps, there were, there were thousands of places. We know, uh, well, we know of many, many of them. The, the greatest, if you want to say that, the, the one that, is, um, uh, that, that was absolutely a, a killing factory and is, is studied continually is Auschwitz. And that's probably for another number of reasons. First of all, the, the sheer number of people who who they um, who were executed there, but also that in uh, in the um, end of the Holocaust, when there was the march of people from the camps in hiding them further into to Europe to 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 deal with this, the the Allied forces getting closer, Auschwitz is basically intact. And has been left intact. And so it is today a museum, and it is one that is visited in Auschwitz I, which is the one where the, the, the gate is that you've seen the sign that says, uh, all work will set you free. Auschwitz I are where the, um, where the brick buildings are. And that is, uh, there is the crematorium, the, the gas chamber and crematorium is still intact there, and one can see that. Um, I spend a week each summer going there with uh, the law students of Creighton, Creighton University's law school program called Nuremberg to the Hague, where they study international justice. And I accompany the group to Krakow and to Auschwitz. And then the second, there were three parts of the camp. The second part is about three miles away, two, three miles away called Birkenau. And that's where there were four gas chambers and crematoriums that have all, that were all blown up, but the remains are there and barracks are there, and so and and purposefully, the Polish government has turned that into a uh, a museum. So and one of the reasons we know about it, and then also because of the sheer number, um, there are survivors from Auschwitz. Um, just as a side note, when you see somebody who has a tattoo number on their arm, that was done only at Auschwitz. It's commonly thought that it, that it was everywhere, but it was only Auschwitz, but, we, but we, we know of them. All right, so first of all, let me pause for a second and see if there's any questions that you may have at this point. I don't see anything in the okay. chat yet, Scott. Okay. Can everybody just um, know that you can send your questions to, uh, to moderator Barbara Velasquez. Okay, thank you. So, um, First of all, the process of the not of World War II and what the Nazis did is a gradual uh, is not a gradual spectrum, and it starts with in the 1930s with uh, with the National Socialists coming into power. It starts with the Nuremberg Laws, where um, that were gradually taking away the rights of Jews and were. Um, were degrading Jews as being less than human and basically creating a brainwashed society or a, a, um, a, a way of thinking of Jews as less than human. Now in Germany, I believe there were between 150 and 200,000 Jews. This all changes and, and basically the Nazi machine changes on September 1st, 1939, with the invasion of Poland. And at that point, the Jewish question becomes even greater. And what begins to develop at this period, and by the time 
actually, well, in, in 42, I believe it is the final solution as, 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 a for, as a real project even really takes off with the Wanisi Conference. But in, in 1939, again, when they invade Poland, the Jewish question becomes even greater and, and much more of a, um, of, of a situation for the Germans because they go from having between 150,000, 200,000 Jews that they want to just basically have move as, um, as they, to get rid of them, not necessarily kill them Im immediately. Um, now it now it becomes it, it becomes a, a killing field if you want to say that and in german i mean in poland it begins with the einstadt gruppen and those were the vigilante and and nazi soldiers who who go into the basically killing fields where they take jews from small villages take them out into the fields sometimes have them dig trenches sometimes don't but they shoot them and and it's known the, the topical name for it is, and the study is called Holocaust by Bullets. And it is believed during that time that between a million and a half to two million of the six million Jews are killed during that time. And there is a, um, a, a man out of, uh, out of France, his name, he's a Catholic priest named Father Patrick Dubois, who runs an organization right now that is still involved in trying to document and find each of these killing fields in, in Eastern Europe. And they're mainly in the small villages and communities. But again, this lasts a very short time, believe it or not, but, by, but things are different in, in each country. And so Germany heads into the Netherlands in on May 10th, 1940. And again, this is when, and as the book documents, when, when things change. And you and each story is kind of uniquely different, meaning that you know you'll have um, you have some people who are able to leave, you have some people who weren't, you have some people who are able to go into hiding. It, it really is, it's it's you know, there there are um thousands and thousands and thousands actually of stories. Um, and then unfortunately, there's also millions of stories we'll never know. So I'm going to um, first, uh, I'm going to go into share screen and I want to just play a short clip. Um, one of the, the great things that happened, if you want to say it that way, in Holocaust education, as a result of the movie Schindler's List that came out in 1993, the Holocaust education evolved to a rebirth in many ways in, if, in the United States, if not the world. And, and Steven Spielberg realized the power of his movie. And he dedicated funds and time and ability in the early 1990s to document the testimony of survivors. And so thousands and thousands of survivors' testimony was recorded as a result of the of what happened in dialogue after Schindler's List, and so in in many they're they're available for educational research. And the USC Shoah Foundation has, in in many cases, as part of curriculum, have um, earmarked certain testimonies, people think, so that we can use. So we have, as an example, with with our survivor community, um, there are eight survivors currently still living. Um, most of them are in advanced ages of life, but we have with a number of ones from our community, we have their, their testimonies recorded in, in our archives to be used. But I'd like to play you uh, one from the Shoah Foundation that talks about, first of all, the invasion of what, it, what happened, what it was firsthand experience when um, the Nazis came into the Netherlands. So give me one second. Tell us about the day that the Nazis declared war on the Netherlands. That day started, I woke up. That was in May? That was the 10th of May, 1940. I woke up early in the morning, terrible noise, and my mother came running in my bedroom, grabbed me out of bed, and run with me in the basement. And we heard 
like falling glass and it 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 was we we, we were both trembling and then and, and waiting there till it got quiet and then my mother left me in the basement and she said stay here and then very careful she went upstairs to look what had happened my father wasn't home because the the, the bakery was not by the store so he had gone at uh, two in the night to that bakery so i was with my mother at that uh, that point and then my mother went upstairs and then she saw that the big uh, windows from the store had broken and people came out outside neighbors and uh, so then she came to to get me and she dressed me a little bit and uh, and then we heard that the military compound that was about a mile from our house on the same main thoroughfare had been bombed by the Germans. And because of that bombardment from the, 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 the windows of the, of the, the houses and, and our store had, had broken. And so we, yeah, we were all in a very... Uh, scared and we didn't know know what to do so as you can see oops, excuse me let me make sure turn this off um you have you know different i mean again there are lots of different unique experiences and and what what i i the one first point i want to make here is that um, when you talk to survivors, when you hear testimony of survivors, there are many, many different types of stories and not necessarily um, that everyone is um, report here being sent to the ghetto um, death camp. And um, there, were, there were cases where there are obviously hidden people that were hidden and i think one thing that's that's good about this book is that um that it, it talks about another example of how people were hidden and what i mean by that is one of the challenges that we face as holocaust educators is that the diary of anne frank which is an amazing story and a very interesting book in many cases because of how successful it has been used as a as a resource whether teachers forget to say it or don't know um there sometimes is the appearance that the only person who was ever hidden during the holocaust or had that experience and again i'm not at all trying to make a joke this is just my observation is anne frank and in fact there are hundreds if not thousands of stories like this and um, I have a book right back here called Salvage Pages that was put together by a scholar that is taking that through uh, research of archives. I think the archives at the at the Holocaust Museum in DC. This was done about twenty some years ago of excerpts from diaries, different you know different um, people who were hidden and or different experiences that go along you know that that same element and so one of the challenges we have today actually in holocaust education is absolutely people should use the diary of van frank but and it is a very much a unique again every story is unique but there are there are numerous stories of being hidden so even as an example one of our local survivors his name is fred cater dr fred cater he is the youngest of our survivors he's 85 years old now at four years he was he was he was born in belgium and he and his mother were told to report to the train station for deportation and again he's four years old they get to the train station they get to the steps of the train station and his mother says let go of my hand and walk away now any of you who are parents and i said i'm parents of an of adult children 
Um, I still wonder if they can get along sometimes on their own now as they're in their late 20s and almost 30. But at four years old, he let go of his mother's hand and he walked away. And he, I recently asked him, I always assumed that in his story that he, he was actually rescued by a, um, um, a nun. A nun found him and took him to an orphanage to hide him. And I always, I asked him, actually the last time I saw him a couple of weeks ago, I said, Fred, do you think that that woman was looking for people, like for that opportunity at the train station? And he said, no, because he was wandering the streets. I, I don't know why I just assumed that he was picked up right away, but he, he walked away for whatever reasons wasn't seen. He was wandering the streets when he got picked up by this, this nun and she took him to an orphanage and he was hidden. He, be, he was a hidden child. And in his story, he didn't really find, he, after though he survived, he was eight years old when the war was over. He was, he went to live with an uncle in Montreal afterwards who had gotten out of uh, Holland before the war. And he spent well into his adulthood knowing very little about his life. In the 1990s, he went to a conference for hidden children in New York. And there was a man who was giving a presentation on a book of the Jews of Belgium. And he went up to the man afterwards and said to him, told him what his, his name was, his birth name was, and said, I, you know, I doubt you have any information, but could you pos do you possibly have any idea, any, any information on my family? And the man said, not only do I have information, not only do I know who your family is, opens up the book to whatever page and has a picture of Fred's family there. And that opened the door for Fred find, beginning to find out his story. And even, and he's, this is in the 1990s, and even as late as December of 2022, I got contacted by a woman whose father had recently passed away and he had been hidden at an orphanage in Belgium and found a, and there's a book now later on written a couple of years ago about this area. And Fred's name is in there and she Googled Dr. Fred Cater and found out he's in Omaha, Nebraska, and that he works, does talks with the, uh, with the Institute for Holocaust Education. And she contacted me to see if I could put them in contact. And so after I spoke with her and, found, and realized she was legitimate, that this was really, she showed me a picture that she had of her father, of a group of children in the orphanage that Fred was in. And it turned out we also have a copy of that same, of a picture very similar at that same photo at that same time, but from a different angle. And so she shared the picture with me and I put her in touch with Fred and gave Fred a copy of that picture. So again, you know, some, some uniqueness there. But um, any questions? And I, I very much always wander off topic, just so you know. Oh, yes. Um... Let me give you a question that came in. This is specific to the book. Mm -hmm. um, do you know how far apart the Ten Boon household was from the Brils? The Brils, I could never, I don't know how to say the last name of those young ladies. <laughs> yeah, that, that I don't. I mean, I'm not very familiar. You know, to be honest with you, um, when I when I was asked to read the book, um, that was the first time I'd have heard the story, you know, heard these sisters story and did my, my own research because uh, I was interested in knowing a little bit more. And I, I don't know with a lot of the, the location type details. What I do know is that there are not numerous, but there are lots of examples of people trying to do exactly what the sisters tried to do. The hardest part of it in many ways, and, and you find this also in the diary of Anne Frank, is the secrecy involved in it. And, and you know, and, and we see examples that the sisters raise of, of you know, these 
Um, one of my mentors says there's no such thing as coincidences or you know, luck in a sense, but there are numerous examples that happen where, you know, but for a moment's grace, something else could have happened. And so, um, you know, that we see, a, we see a lot of that, you know, in, in these stories. And we see that with, with discussions of some of the people they come across. The other thing is, and this is something that, that I wrestle with in my own personality of wondering, and that is, when do you know when to trust and when do you know not to trust? So meaning the idea of how much you divulge to people in order to gain, to, in order for their, their assistance and help and how quiet you have to be about some of the things because the less people know about what's going on, the less chance there is of somebody finding out what's happening and people being turned in. And, and when I want to raise something with that, you know, I say that we want to train people to be upstanders and to do the right thing. One of the things that we also talk about with everybody is one truly doesn't know what they would do, what they would do placed in placed in a certain situation. Okay. That um they um uh uh What, you know, in a life and death situation. And so, you know, there, there's also the, the idea of, you know, one would think they would do the right thing. We hope they would do the right thing. But um, there was, people were placed in very challenging times. Um, there's a new study out about uh, who possibly turned in the Frank family in the in the diary of Anne Frank. It was actually on 60 Minutes a little over a year ago. And there was all these wrestling um, intellectually about it because it may have been somebody in the Jewish community. And people within the Jewish community, you know, said things like, you know, how could a, a Jew turn in another Jew and look what we were going through? And truly, we don't know what we would do in, in the situation. And, and actually just added to that, um, things like uh, the events in the Warsaw Ghetto and, and how people helped each other and maybe where they didn't. Um, it's only recently now that we're starting to study the, some of the, the life in the Warsaw Ghetto to understand some of the deeper complexities of it. Some of it also has to deal with not wanting to, um, well, our survivors are still with us, not have certain type of discussions that would possibly um, not be pleasant to the memory of, the, of those who perished. Um, so uh, in 1940, in May, uh, on May 10th, the Netherlands were invaded. Four days later, German planes bombed Rotterdam. The Germans tried to halt the raid on the city because Dutch authorities had agreed to negotiate the surrender of their country. However, a communication failed, delaying the order to halt the attack. The bombing destroyed much of the city center, leaving almost 80,000 people homeless. The Netherlands surrendered just a few hours later. And on May 15th, in retaliation for the bombing, uh, Rot at Rotterdam, the British Air Forces attacked a, uh, a German industry in, in, in a different community. Um, during 1940, the German occupation uh, of the Netherlands banned Jews from civil service, required Jews to register their assets of their enterprises. And this was in, 19, in January of 1941. The German authorities required all Jews to register, register themselves as Jews. A total of 159,806 persons registered, including 19,561 persons born of mixed marriages. The, uh, the total included 25,000 Jewish refugees from the German Reich. That would have been actually the Frank family. The Jewish Council was established in, um, in February of 1941. Now, these all fell under what was established in Germany in the 1930s known as the Nuremberg Laws. And the Nuremberg Laws did numerous things. One of them is that they were a form of persecution of Jews to take away their rights, to lower their, 
their humanness in a sense. They could no longer shop at Gentile businesses. They couldn't go to German schools. This is the initiation of the yellow star that they had to wear. But also what's very interesting is though the Nazis are the perpetrators and the Nazis carried these events out, how they tried to, for lots of different reasons, in a sense, take away their own culpability. So for example, they forced Jews in these areas to establish Jewish councils. And they would say to these councils, things like, you need tomorrow, you know, that on Tuesday, X amount of Jews need to report for deportation and you need to figure out who they are. Um, and it, it's a very interesting concept in their bureaucracy and also whether they realized they were also doing it to one, take away their culpability, to take away their direct involvement. That, you know, it's, it's probably all of the above. Uh, just as an interesting side note, um, in what I've mentioned about Holocaust by bullets, Germans and vigilantes that they recruited from the cities are the are the ones who did the firing squads. I mean, they you know there's some very famous pictures. When it came time for the gas chambers, the moving of Jews through the through the process, meaning moving them into the room where they took off their clothes, into the gas chamber, dying, being moved out carried out of there, moved into the crematorium, were all done by, Jew by Jewish prisoners. The only thing that, I mean, Nazis did it all, but their only direct thing there that they did in this was a German officer on top of the gas chamber would drop the Zyklone B gas uh, uh, crystals into the chamber that it would then crystallize. So, in a, you know, they would, they would, one, take away their visual of it, and maybe you know well there's there's lots of discussions with that but they um they didn't take well they they took away some they didn't take away their direct responsibility they are the one and only people responsible for it but they maybe it was the the ability to keep using the troops they used and the only reason we know today how the gas chambers actually operated at Auschwitz was during the death marches when they when they cleared out the prisoners at Auschwitz, many of them. They also um, the the um, Sonder command who were in charge of they were Jewish prisoners who were in charge of having to do this. Many of them were on a death march, and there was a, a very faint well, a, an educator from Yad Vashem. His name is Gideon Greif. His work was that one of the areas of his expertise was. Um, interviewing all the surviving Sondergruppen who came to live in Israel, I think some in Germany too, uh, about how things operated. Because um, the Nazis actually, as I said, the gas chambers at Auschwitz uh, in, in uh, Birkenau, they destroyed all four of them. They're just, they're rubble there now. So let me stop here for a second and see if there's any questions. Okay, well, <clears throat> I want to thank you, uh, first of all, Scott, because you're giving us such of a more in-depth and wide view of this period of history. Um, so last week, people across the world celebrated International Women's Day. This book really showed the courage, dedication, and impact of women, and we hope will inspire others both men and women to know they can make a difference today and for history. Um, in your work, do you feel like that people are seeing that they have responsibilities for others and that they can make a difference when they when they learn about stories like this? So, you know, that's a great question. I am fascinated today why people are so interested in the Holocaust and don't realize that there are numerous genocides that they should also uh, be understanding and learning about. So that is very interesting. However, I do believe that 
and when you speak the time of direct survivors unfortunately is coming to an end um but when you speak with survivors they 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 want to make a difference they want you to know their story because they want you to see the cruelty of humanity but they want you to understand that you have a personal responsibility and you can make a direct difference and that um, it's very interesting. They also do something else, just as a side note. They will tell you how many children they have, but then they start to talk about their grandchildren. And when they're talking about their grandchildren, what they're really doing is they're saying they came to destroy us and we, and they didn't, and we're going on and we're becoming something. And that's what they want. There is a great uh, movie. You can find it. It's called Big Sonia. And Big Sonia is a woman who um, came to live in Kansas City. Her granddaughter made this movie called Big Sonia on her. She actually spoke here a number of years ago. And Big Sonia is, is like the speaker of survivors in Kansas City. And in one of her talks, she inspired a, a young lady, a high school, I think the girl was a, at this point was in junior high school, middle school. And this young lady, as a result of hearing Big Sonia, is now running her own nonprofit in some area where she's out there with an issue helping people. And so I believe through empathy, understanding, and teaching people to have the opportunity to be an upstander and not a bystander, we can change the world. So I wanna tell you two examples of also things I mean with this. In my job, we have some very interesting phone calls and very interesting things that happen. We do not embarrass people. We do not publicly criticize people. In this age of cancel culture, we do not cancel people. In West, at Westside School District, three years ago, there was a very, very wonderful teacher. This is the height COVID had just hit. She did a quote of the day. She doesn't even know why she did this, or quote of the week. She put a quote up on the board, on her, and she it was attributed to Adolf Hitler. Now, did she do it because she wanted to get them to think about it? Did she do it because, I can't believe Adolf Hitler said something that we could learn from, whatever. Parents went ballistic. There was on Facebook everywhere, you got to, we got a call for this teacher to be fired, blah, 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 blah. We got a call from the school district. What should we do? How can you help us? Whatever. We said, simple. This is education. This is an opportunity to educate. So we, we spoke with the teacher. We spoke with the school district. We spoke with a thousand kids at the middle school where it happened. We made a new partner. We have an, an exhibit called the Anne Frank Traveling Exhibit an education program and traveling exhibit. We thought we were only gonna take this out into rural Nebraska. This year, we took it into Westside High School and Middle School. Over 3,000 people participated in this educational opportunity. If we would have called this person out and said, how dare you, you've insulted us, blah, 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 she should be fired, we'd get nowhere. There was a member of our, of our uh, Pointed by the former governor to the state school district, uh, state school board, who uh, put on Twitter a quote uh, uh, saying that wearing of masks and ma and vaccine mandates is the same as the Jews having to wear yellow stars in Nazi Germany. I don't care politically where he stands. I don't care where he stands on that. It is absolutely a non-truth. The Nuremberg laws were initiated to take away the rights of Jews to destroy the Jewish people. I sent him a very pleasant email. First of all, congratulated him on being appointed to the state school board. And I saw the public tweets you made about this. And as a Holocaust educator, I'd love to talk to you about why we don't say things like that. And he came and he came, I thought I'd never hear from something from him. And he, um, I, that was my, excuse me, that was my, my opinion. I shouldn't have said that, but um, he did come and speak with me. And he agreed not to make those comments again. And he has not made those comments again. There was a situation in Elkhorn 
where a young lady made a uh, a joke, uh, a Holocaust joke. It got posted on uh, TikTok. Her 30 seconds of stupidity went virtual and it was brought to our attention. And we met with the students involved and we talked to them about, we, we introduced them through an exhibit we have to our survivors. This young lady was not anti-Semitic. She was not, she was being a, a, a kid. And so, and now we're doing things at Elkhorn School District. So everything is an opportunity, hopefully to educate. We deal, um, I will tell you, um, we have little to no success with someone who is a Holocaust denier. We luckily we don't deal with too much of that, um, but we get into the schools and um, it's, I just checked out an email I just received next week. We run our week of understanding where we bring in mainly second generation speakers now use second generation speakers here we will reach 5000 people next week hearing the stories of survivors and with the message of make this world a better place. Um, the state legislature passed LB 888 uh, last year that requires the teaching of the Holocaust and other genocides. I testified in front of the Unicameral Education Committee last week about the funding of it. Um, hopefully the funding bill, it's gonna make it out of committee. Hopefully it'll make it to the floor. There's some possibility it won't because of lots of things that the Unicameral is tied up with, but um, we've got lots of partners. I have a, a, an amazing education coordinator who works with me and an amazing group of volunteers. Um, we have an essay contest where we get into the high schools. We have an art contest where we get into the middle schools. We have an exhibit that we're redoing that we're going to be doing with the Samuel Bach uh, Learning Center as a part of UNO. We're making new partners with College of St. Mary, with the Freed Academy at UNO, with the Harris Center at, at UNL with, as I said, with, with the Anne Frank Center. Um, everything is an opportunity to educate. I, I'm, I'm, you know, my background is a teacher. I'm, I'm, I will never, um, I'm always satisfied with what we do, but I'm a teacher. So that means you always got to see what, what else can you do? And um, I actually think we take a horrible situation and we try to make it, um, we try to take, in Judaism, we say when somebody passes away, we say, may their memory be for a blessing. And um, I was, given the honor um, this past summer when I was with the group with the group of, of uh, students from Creighton at Auschwitz-Birkenau at the end where we stand in a in a field where the remains the ashes of thousands of hundreds of thousands of Jews were dumped because the uh, Nazis all they cared about were killing um, I was honored and asked to say the last words and um, at first, I didn't know what to say, and then it, then it absolutely came to me. Um, I'm of Ashkenazic Jewish heritage. That means my family came from Eastern Europe. Ashkenazic Jews name name their children. The tradition is to name after to name their children after family members who have passed away, so that they'll be like that person. Millions of our people who died, their whole lineage, their whole family line, was. There is nobody there to remember them. There is nobody there to, to know who they were. And it's my job, it's our job to say, and what we say is may their memory be for a blessing. And so it's our job to, um, to make their memory a blessing, even though for probably at least 2 million of those that, that perish, we will have no idea ever who they were. Um, I'm optimistic. We, we, I know we make a difference, um, but I keep that in check, meaning I'm not egotistic or egocentric with it. Um, we still got a lot of work to do. And, um, you know, I've tried to encourage legislature, for example, um, to have anti-bullying legislation and to, you know, the, the political climate is very, very charged. I don't care what side of the aisle you're on. You can be nice to, nicer to each other because it can lead to horrible things. 
Thank you, thank you. Um, and let me say that we have one of our librarians watching today, and she wants everybody to know that the DVD Big Sonia is available for checkout at MCC Libraries. Oh, please check it out. It is, first of all, she is hilarious, but it's it's powerful. Um, the other thing I, I'd like to just say with this, um, there, and this is one of the things, my mother is a, is a uh, um, I don't know if she's my biggest fan. Uh, actually, one of my biggest fans is on right now on this. But uh, um, the uh, uh, there are lots and lots of books out there, hundreds, if not thousands of books. I'd like to just say one opinionated comment of mine. Um, please read nonfiction. Don't read fiction on the Holocaust. Um, in many cases, the things they present never happened never could have happened, never would have happened, never should have happened. And um, I think it does a disservice because even if there's a disclaimer that says, this is fixed, this is not a true story, still in your brain, you think differently. What the beauty of, for example, that this book and many, and then this book just came out in the last five years is that there are still lots of stories out there to read. Um, I may, you know, suggestions. I'm a huge personal fan of Elie Wiesel, um, his book Night, which is also read everywhere. I love everything he's ever done. He's a personal hero of mine. Um, here's a picture, and you can't see it, of me and him. Uh, he spoke in Lawrence, Kansas in 1988, right after I moved here. Uh, there's a, a person on this call on this right now who was one of my students at that time. And after I taught her class, I jumped in a car with two colleagues of mine and we went to Lawrence, Kansas to hear him speak. I'd, he I'd heard him speak numerous times. And then there was a reception afterwards at the president of the university's house. We were not invited and we knocked on the door and said, could we just come in for five minutes? We'd just like to shake his hand and tell him what he means to us. And the president of the university said, yes, of course. And I have no idea because this is way before cell phones. One of us had a camera and took a picture and I have uh, this picture um, with me. Um, so that's what I have to say. I will say the one thing in the book that I, I kept trying to find specific information for and I haven't been able to. And please understand, I am not at all questioning this. I just want there's things that in details that I want to know more. Um, the, um, the, the, the meeting or the, the, the introduction to the Frank children to, uh, I'm fascinated by that. Um, and I, I was trying to find some documentation to that. And um, uh, again, I'm not saying it didn't happen at, at all. I, I'm just in, in Holocaust circles, that's that's what what happens. You you hear something, learn something, you want to find more detail about it. So, and and I I haven't been able to. Uh, right, but, I think in the book, I don't know if I read it at the end, but that came up that the the names of the Franks were not on lists. No, they're not. Um, but that's very typical too. And you know, it's interesting. I had someone say to me, um, we worked with the Rose. This is right as COVID was hitting uh, on the diary. They did the diary of Anne Frank. And a, a woman said to me, I saw their grave site. Because there's a stone, there's a marker there. There's there there isn't a grave site. I mean, we, you know, they they didn't, we don't know that. Um, you know, it's we know records of numbers from the, the Nazis themselves keeping them. The names of people typically don't come from that. And so there was a project done through Yad Vashem. Unfortunately, it's winding down because of the reality of survivors called the Names Project, where it encouraged survivors to fill out paperwork on anybody and everybody who they knew and if they knew something about what happened to them, and even if they didn't know, so that they could document. Now, sometimes people can be a little bit superstitious. And this is my view in here, but I can prove this with Ashkenazic Jews. Um, every so often you hear about two people who survived the Holocaust 
and 50, 60, 70 years old, because of some weird event, they find each other. Those are very, very few and far between and almost non-existent. And sometimes people didn't want to fill out the paperwork in hopes that they were going to find their loved one. Or also, if they filled out the paperwork, that was an admission that they may have died. And they didn't want, it's not that they, they, they wanted to keep up hope that they would still find these people. So no, there's not, there's never going to be, you know, like, I, I mean, that's why we say that, you know, really, that, that's why it really got to me when I was looking into this field this, this summer and knowing that the remains of hundreds of thousands of people are a part of the, the landscape there, we're never going to know who they, who they are and, and who they were. So um, that's, you know, that, that this, the, um, the, the, and I'll leave you with this. Um, my training is to talk about the individual, are the stories, the people. And I think you're much more effective when you tell the stories of the two sisters, when you tell Anne Frank, Ellie Wiesel, uh, Big Sonia, because we can all relate to the individual. And that's, that's what our obligation is. Um, what are we gonna do as we move forward? Well, that's what we're figuring. That's what we're figuring out. We have lots of recordings. There are some people who wonderful, wonderful philanthropists who are investing money in in educational circles to help us develop the resources to tell the stories. Unfortunately, um, there will never be the the uh, power of hearing a direct survivor um, is unlike anything. But those are few and far between now. Um, I welcome in the next, in the last couple of minutes I have any questions and I want to thank you for allowing me to speak. Thanks. I want to thank you, Scott. You've really, really um, given us a wider view of how to use literature like this. Um, it's just been so helpful. I know personally, I wanted to keep hitting myself like, I don't know the geography. I don't get, you know, you've helped me with that just yeah, that's a it, that's really interesting. And sometimes the geography plays in. You know, for example, one of the reasons that the Jews of of Denmark, it was a small area, were saved was because they just had to cross over a small river into Sweden. It was you know it was the luck of location, but in you know in Poland and and places like Russia, it, it, you know I mean northern Africa, it didn't happen. All right. Well, um, I'm just going to invite you, Scott, if you have any final comments you'd like to have uh, share with us, because we we are running towards the end of our time. Um, my, I, I work for the Institute for Holocaust Education, I-H-E-N-E dot -E org. Um, if you have questions, if you want resources, please contact us. Barbara has my contact information. Please feel free to share my email. Um, I'm, I'm here. So, you know, I welcome any questions you have afterwards and please don't hesitate to get in touch with me. And again, thank you for this opportunity. All right. So thank you very, very much. This is just really, really, um, an insightful discussion. And I, Scott said to me, I'm not going to do a book report. And I think this has been really interesting to, to take it to a different level. So thank you very much. I, I trust that this could be the beginning of some new connections with Metropolitan Community College and the larger community who join us. And we thank you, Scott, for allowing us to record also so that people can continue to watch uh, your program. For everybody out there who might be wanting to re-watch, we're usually a having that link available within a couple weeks and it would be back on the Metro YouTube page or mccneb.edu slash book series. You could find it there. If you can't find it at any time, contact me and I'll work that out with you. At the same time, I'd like to thank the Metropolitan Community College Library staff. Some were with us today and sharing important information, but annually they assist us in setting up the book series and they are kind and pro and provide kind and professional attention to all of 
us who love to read or need to read. Um, they, during the pandemic, they work things out. And now you might wonder at the Fort Omaha campus what to do, but I wanna remind you the Digital Express is in building 10 and your books that you want from the library can be delivered there. And our librarians will help you with those deliveries. So, Sydney, thank you for your help today as our technician. Would you please put up the sign for the evaluation? And um, the, we do appreciate your feedback. This link is also in the chat. If you can't find it and you gave us a good email address, you will get that in an email following today's program. And I have Ann Naples saying, Scott should mention the third Thursday presentations. Would you like to share that, Scott? Sure, we, thank you. Uh, we do an, a monthly uh, lunch and learn. Uh, it's at 11.30 uh, by Zoom on the third Thursday of every month. We use lots of different scholars. If you would like to be on our email list to receive the link and information on it, um, please email me. Uh, Barbara, you could feel free to share my email address. I let me see if I can put it in the yeah. chat because I I said I don't chew gum and uh, and walk and do well at the same time. But um, Scott might be able to get that in the chat, and I will also send his email out in that follow up email. Yeah, I'll be very happy to to put you on our list. There's no um, if you don't come, you don't come. If you do, we also post it a few days later on the Jewish Federation of Omaha. YouTube page, so that's all we always record it. Um, this month we're talking about the use of drama and, uh, through the Anne Frank Center. Um, we do lots of different topics. It's it's a and it's a part of it. It's a wonderful, wonderful, dear program to us. All right, and then everybody, let's check out the next programs coming up. We have uh, Sydney's going to put up Thursdays. Thank you to Teresa Foley who has found a fashion industry legend who is a native of Nebraska, Cambridge, Nebraska. Her name is Mary Lou Luther. She is now uh, retired, but she still lives in New York City and she has many friends of anybody that you know in fashion. I am sure Mary Lou uh, was sometime involved in that person's life. And it's a beautiful story because she was thrown into fashion reporting after leaving journalism school out of stereotyping. She didn't know anything about it and she became this legend. So we hope that you will join us on Thursday at 10.30 a.m. CDT. We will be speaking with Mary Lou and she will be delighted um, to receive your questions. She also has just written a book that's a delightful new book and those who attend will have a chance at winning copies of her book. So then I'd like you to look at the next book series. This is the last book um, in our book series for this academic year called House of Sticks, a memoir. And the discussion will be David Din, who is a University of Nebraska Lincoln graduate, now leaving um, in another state, but he is excited to come and lead the discussion. He himself came to the United States as a Vietnamese refugee, so um, he's excited about this opportunity. And back to the library, if you wanna to read today's book, The Sisters of Oswich, or if you'd like to start reading House of Sticks, we have copies in the library for you. So you don't have to buy the book, you don't have to win the book, you can get a copy from the library. Have a great afternoon, everybody. And I really thank you for being with us here today. Take care.